The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Typebond. So today I've got a great project for you. This is my mom's new dining room table. It's actually a couple of months old at this point, but uh, features breadboard ends. It's all made of solid cherry, some nice curved legs to match these chairs that I got from my buddy Matt Cremona. It's a great little set. Now we actually have this full entire build, five videos, about two and a half hours of content over at the Wood Whisperer Guild. And guess what? It's free. All you have to do is go over to thewoodwhispererguild.com, sign up for an account, and you get the project for free. Free plan, everything. And it's a good way to get a taste of the guild. If you've heard me talk about the Wood Whisperer Guild in the past, it's where we do our advanced courses and really in-depth videos. Well, you can go there and check it out all for free. All right, but if you're not interested in that, we're gonna have a short version of it. I'm gonna show you how the table was made. We're gonna start with the legs. For the legs, I want to disguise the glue line by putting it at the corner, instead of in the middle of a face. So I'll be gluing two pieces of 8 quarter stock together and then carefully cutting it at a 45 degree angle to yield a smaller leg blank where the glue line runs corner to corner. The first cut is at 45 degrees. And just a couple words of advice with this cut. It can be a little bit tricky, you know, so you want to make sure you've got a ripping blade in here. Anything with too many teeth? Once it's buried in a solid piece like that, it's gonna fight you. The other thing is, as you're pushing through, you have to understand that at a certain point, you're losing half of your support, right? And you are sort of tilting this way. It naturally wants to go that way. So this is why, this is one of the few times you will see me do something we generally don't do in woodworking, and that's reach behind the blade. The reason I did that is for safety reasons. I need to keep my blank against the fence, but continue to push through. And the only way I could safely do that is with pressure here so that you don't wind up tipping into the blade and falling over. All right, this first cut on each one of these pieces, we can make the change as needed to make sure we are right on our pencil lines. And then the remaining cuts will be at 90 degrees. Now with that second cut, I hope you can start to see the rhyme and reason that we're doing this. We now have our new 90 degree corner. This method yields a hidden glue line as well as beautiful riffs on grain on all faces. Now the inside faces of each leg will receive a mortise for the aprons. Next, we have to give the legs their sexy shape. This is a two-part cut. After the first cut, we tape the offcuts back onto the blank to help stabilize it. This also gives us our pencil lines back so that we can make the second cut. And there's our leg. The faces of the leg are now pillowed. I'll use a little template to give me some guidelines and then I'll use a plane and rasp to establish the shape. A detail like this is by no means necessary, but I think it looks cool. Alright, so one of the last shaping tasks, now that we've kind of gone to all of our corners, is to mark a little pencil on here. Using a rasp or card scraper, we'll be able to kind of contour this and just make it nice and smooth, or at least as close as we can. So now this is a lot of rinse and repeat. We're gonna sand up through the grits on each face, bring it up to finish grit. On the flat sides, you could definitely use either a sanding block or your random orbit sander just to clean that up. Now the final treatment for the leg is rounding over the sharp corners. We'll do the best we can and then use, um, you know, sandpaper or hand tools to get where we need to be. With something that's been shaped this much, there's a real good chance that you could transfer scratch marks, whether it's from the rasp, from the original band sawing. Um, but look at it in different lights. You might even take a little mineral spirits or water wipe down and just see if you could find any scratches in the surface. Um, but once you clean all those up, you scrape it, sand it, get it up through the grits. This is about what we're aiming for. Next up, we can cut the four aprons.
These are pretty straightforward, but they do have tenons on each end, so I'll use the table saw to make the tenon cuts. When sizing tenons, it's always good to have a test piece to work on first, but when you don't, you'll be experimenting on your actual workpiece, so here's a pro tip. Only cut the very tip of the tenon as you dial in the size. If you happen to cut too deep, you can correct it and then cut the rest of the tenon to the proper dimension. If the front quarter inch or so is loose, it's not a big deal. The tenons are then rounded so that they fit nicely into our rounded mortises. Now if you think it's faster to square off the mortise instead, you're probably also the kind of person that puts their toilet paper on the holder like this. All four aprons receive a nice, subtle curve. Not only does it look cool, uh, having the aprons lift slightly actually provides a little bit more clearance for when you have basketball players over to eat. So now we're just going to take the two that we have already cleaned up, use those as templates on the other ones. You could do a flush trim here if you wanted to, but with only two of them, it's just as easy to cut at the bandsaw and then just refine by hand. Now that's almost it for the rails. So at this point, we can kind of get ready for finishing. You want to sand both of the surfaces to whatever grit you're going up to. I'm going to go to 180 on mine, clean those up, and then add a little bit of an edge profile. Ours will be that little eighth inch round over that we've been using so far. Uh, remember, you only need to round over the bottom where that curve is. If you round over the top, that's where the top interface is with this, and it'll look weird if you have a round over there. So don't worry about rounding over any of that edge. We will only round over this front edge. For unnecessary levels of strength and to thematically tie the legs into the tabletop, I'll drill for some pins that'll go through the legs and into the tenons. Now we can do the assembly. I'll start with the short sides as sub-assemblies. You want to make sure your apron is flush with the top of your leg and just enough pressure to close up our gaps. Once those are dry, I'll bring the two sub-assemblies together with the long aprons using some Type Bond Extend, which is the perfect glue to use when you just want a little bit more assembly time. Make sure that your aprons are flush with the tops of your legs. For the dowels, I'll roll my own. Commercial dowels are often weak because the grain usually runs out to the side. If you make your own by riving the wood so that it splits along the grain, you can ensure that you have the strongest dowels possible without as much of a chance of them breaking under pressure. It's also super fun to swing a hatchet around the shop and then beat the shit out of some wood pegs with a mallet. The holes in the legs need to be extended through the tenons and into the wood behind the tenon, and then the pegs can be driven in. You'll hear that sound. That tells you when you hit home. After trimming flush, the surface is sanded smooth. There we go. And look at those pretty pegged tenons. Next up, we'll make our top. I'm actually using thicker stock here, just so that I have enough material to mill it nice and flat without ending up with a top that's too thin. For the glue up, I'm using dominoes to help with alignment. This is super handy on a big top like this where calls would be really difficult to use. So now we can start adding some clamping pressure across each one of these. I like to add a little bit at a time. Snug them up, you should start seeing a little bit of squeeze out. And now I will add additional clamps 
going the other way. This is just something I've been in the habit of doing from my experience so far. It does make me believe that it's creating an opposing pressure to the orientation of the other clamps that helps the panel stay nice and flat. Even if you don't have enough to get one in between each of these, just a few of them being added can really be helpful. But I can see a pretty nice even bead of squeeze out along each one of these joints and that's what you're looking for. After the panel dries, we'll sand off the glue and then cut the top to final size. Now to cut this tabletop to length, we first have to square it up. So we have one end that's pretty close to even, but we wanna make sure it's a nice dead straight and square side. And then we'll be able to take a measurement, get the length and cut the other side. All right, so we're just gonna flip this around so we can square up the other side and cut it to our final length. And here we go. This tabletop will have breadboard ends, so we'll use a dado stack at the table saw to cut long tenons on each end. To prep for the breadboards, we'll cut a notch at each end of the tenon. And now we just clean that little bit of material off the shoulder. There we go. The breadboard stock is then cut to size. The breadboard will feature draw bores that hold the breadboard onto the table, so we'll drill some holes before cutting the mortise. The mortise, or really a groove, is then cut into the breadboards using a router. With the breadboard in place, we can use the brad point bit to mark the locations of our holes in the table's tenon. The essence of a draw bore is that you shift the peg hole slightly towards the inside by about a 32nd of an inch to a 16th of an inch so that the breadboard gets pulled tight against the shoulder of the tenon when the peg is driven through. In addition to moving the hole's center point, the outer holes will actually become slots so that the peg doesn't restrict the table's side to side movement. Before we attach the breadboards, we have to add the edge detail, which is a steep chamfer. Now you might be wondering why my breadboards are a little bit longer than a table. I do this so that when the table expands and contracts, we'll never see a point where the table is wider than the breadboard, which looks terrible. This decorative detail means that the table will always have a consistent look. Attaching the breadboard involves some careful gluing. We start by gluing the center of the tenon completely. This means that the center will be locked in place and any movement is directed toward the outsides. The peg is driven all the way through the hole. And you can even see how the peg tilts as it goes through the offset hole and then straightens back out. You can see we're poked through about a half inch on the bottom. We'll just let that dry. Now for the outer holes, we want to lock the peg to the breadboard while not gluing it to the table's tenon. So I'll add glue to the hole on the underside. And then after the peg is in place, add some glue at the top and then hammer it in just a little bit more. That's it. Now that technique is applied for all of the slotted pegs. All the pegs are then trimmed flush and sanded. The breadboards now get a slight decorative curve. Followed by the chamfered edge treatment.
And now it's all about details and sanding. This last step can take a full day, since a finish is really only as good as the quality of the surface the finish is applied to. And speaking of finish, it's going to be a hard wax oil. Uh, now, I'll just give you a heads up on this. I have a full video showing how to apply this finish on large surfaces as well as smaller surfaces. So if we're looking at things like the table legs and getting into the aprons, two different ways that you could apply it. To attach the base, we're going to use some small brackets that allow for movement. Once you get that in position, you do want to make sure you loosen up a little bit. In fact, it's not a bad idea to do this by hand. Just give it enough that you, you know if it had pressure, it'd be able to move. Because if you really cinch it down, you've kind of defeated the purpose. And there we go. And you may have to watch these over time. If they loosen up, you might have to tighten them down just a hair. Okay, that feels like it would move under pressure. These, you can definitely put the pressure on. We'll do that all the way around. All right. And now it's time to deliver the table to my mom's house. Like a rock. Are we centering here? Yeah. All right, so I really hope you enjoyed this build. Now, remember, if you go to the thewoodwhispererguild.com, you could pick up this project totally for free and get a view of what the guild is actually like. See a project in action, and you could see what it's all about, right? And that's where we do a lot of our advanced courses and really long, in-depth courses. So go check it out if you're interested. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll catch you next time.